Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Valerie Edgeworth, and I'm one of the CE consultants here at KDLA. Just want to do one last quick sound check, make sure that everyone can hear us. I think we're probably good to go. It's 1 o'clock. So we're going to go ahead and get started with our presentation today on early Kentucky tax records. Uh, with me here today is Kim McDaniel from State Library. She'll be here to help with the chat and to make me aware of any questions. So we're going to go ahead and get started on today's session. Um, why research Kentucky tax lists? Uh, this is a question I hear often, and there are several good reasons. Um, I think they are a very hidden and underused gem, especially for your pre-1850 research. Um, many beginning and even experienced researchers complain about the lack of records prior to the 1850 census. They complain of the non-existence of birth records, uh, multiple people with the same name, and the families who were so poor that they never recorded that they had land or you can't find them in any sort of probate records. Uh, many researchers have not discovered Kentucky tax lists or have never used anything but the transcribed lists. Uh, these original Kentucky tax lists can often be the solution to many of your research problems. Kentucky's tax records are some of the most complete in the nation for this pre-1850 period. Um, it's the only record kept in Kentucky that was created annually on most of the population. Um, your ancestors may have not owned land or have hid from the census taker, uh, but the tax collector usually found them. All men over the age of 21 were required to pay the poll tax in Kentucky. Women who were widowed and owned property were also uh, taxed, and underage men who owned property were taxed. So you've got a lot of the Kentucky population included there. Um, they are written, they're handwritten columns. I'm going to show you some examples here in a minute. Generally, these records are alphabetical by surname, and then they're arranged by district and even neighborhood as the years go on. Uh, one of the first keys I like to tell everyone is that you must research across time in order to gain insight. Um, some researchers will say a five-year span. I recommend kind of a 10-year span, uh, especially in those early, early 19th century records. This can help you determine migration patterns as individuals moved uh, into Kentucky and then a lot of them moved on to uh, Missouri or to Illinois. They may have, uh, say in 1810, they lived in Kentucky, but by 1820, they were in Illinois researching those early tax records between that 10-year time span. You can actually see their migration patterns through some of the counties in the state. It's really a unique, unique resource in that. Um, Kentucky taxed both real and personal property. Real property would equal land. Uh, personal property for this pre-1850 period would have included slaves, cattle, horses, wagons. Um, and there's variations in the columns within the tax list that reflect the changes in the tax law over time. And I didn't add up the total, I should have, but I'm absolutely amazed at the amount of changes that were made to Kentucky tax law almost on a yearly basis during our early years in statehood. So an overview of the tax records and how we're going to approach them today is we're going to look at them for four general time periods. And the reason I posted Kentucky Ancestors here, it's a genealogical publication from the Kentucky Historical Society. There are There's a series of articles written by Candy Atkinson, where most of my information today comes from, on uh, land and tax records. And it breaks it down into these four general time periods. So from statehood to 1840, we're going to take a look at uh, 41 to 60. Then during the Civil War period, from 1861 to 65. And then we're going to look at 1866 through 1880. I've included the link there at the end. It's KentuckyAncestors.org. That publication has now been made available digitally. And so all of these links um, to uh, the articles that Candy has written in this four-part series are available there. One other resource I like to mention, they call it the Second Census of Kentucky that was completed in 1800. I know many of you probably have a copy of the Green Book, as we like to refer to it, in your collection. Um, this is an alphabetical listing of approximately the 32,000 taxpayers uh, that uh, paid taxes during that first uh, few years of statehood. It lists the county of residence and the date of the tax list. So that's how the first, and it, actually the first census of Kentucky was completed in 1790 pre-statehood. So that's why this one's called the second, but it's technically the first post-statehood. So it gets a little confusing. 
This is a typed up resource book. Here's a sample page from it. I was looking for Squire Boone, um, who's about halfway down on the list in Shelby County. And then it gives the information for when the tax was recorded. So then I can go back to the Shelby County tax list for that time period in 1800 and see if I can find Squire on there. Okay, tax list from 1792 to 1840. I don't expect you to be able to read any of the content on any of the images we showed today, but just kind of wanted to give you a general overview of what these registers look like. Um, you can see here this is an alphabetical listing page. You can see D and E, F, and G on there. And then there's the various columns for hashtags. Um, I, I was unable to locate, and I, I didn't have a chance to check with the research room. We may have some template sheets down there that can help with some of those early years. If we do, I'll get some copies of those and send them out with your certificate. I can't recall if we have any or not. I know we do for census records and things of that nature, but I, I, I wasn't able to check on that. So I'm going to do that for you before I send anything out. So this is kind of what those early, early listings look like. There's several points to remember from each of these time periods, and that is a lot of what we're going to cover today. Because as you have researchers come in to look for tax records for certain time periods, these are some of the key things that they need to understand to help them do their research. Um, your county tax list can serve as an annual census. Again, follow those migration patterns. Women, um, who were often the executors of estates, free blacks, and veterans are included on tax lists if they owned as much as one horse. So again, these records, super early records, pre-1850, can help you track someone, even if they did not own land. And they don't necessarily have to be a white male. You're going to find a lot of detail in these records. Um, counties were divided into taxing di districts. You want to check the tax lists from cover to cover. As alphabetical as these things hope to be, and as geographically by district or neighborhood that they hope to be, that's not always the case. So make sure you check the list from cover to cover for each year. The entered, surveyed, and patent to columns should identify those who were involved in the original land patenting um, for the tract of the land to be taxed. So as another way to help you verify a tract of land for those early land grants, um, ditto marks, the word ditto or the word same, are frequently used in the entered, surveyed, and patent to columns. So you may just see those ditto marks or same, same, same for the same person if there's several entries on the same tax list. If the patent to column indicates a patent was issued to the taxpayer, you could look at Jilson's Kentucky Land Grants um, to, to confirm that information. Though those are also green volumes, um, but they are it's also available on Ancestry. You can do a quick quick search on Ancestry for that if you have that in your library. Taxpayers reported all their land holdings, those in their county of residence, as well as other properties that they may have owned in other counties in Kentucky. So again, have to search across counties and across years. Um, you've got to remember your county formation dates. They are extremely critical when researching these early tax records. We, we have 120 counties. And uh, those early years, counties were being formed all the time. Taxpayers can appear on tax lists and not on um, not list any land ownership. Again, as I said on the former page, you may have someone who just owns a horse, but again, they were charged that that tax. Uh, please note, over the years, the headers on these tax lists are going to change. Avoid the mistake of looking at one tax list and thinking that all tax lists are the same way. They changed on a yearly basis. Any questions about that first little series? All right, moving right ahead. This next series that we're going to talk about is the 1841 to the 1860 time period. And from here, things are getting a little bit easier. You can see that the columns along the top here are more typed. This example, I do believe, is from uh, 1850. So again, getting to be a little bit more legible to read. So let's take a look at some of the points to remember if you have a researcher who's using this time period. Um, tax lists may include more than one district in a county. Again, check it from cover to cover. When they included the names of females and minors who were the head of a household, the names of free blacks and white males over the age of 21 who had no taxable property report, commissioners would typically transform the tax assessment process into an unofficial census report. So again, this is a yearly record that is kept in Kentucky and can really help during these migration time periods. 
The, com the tax commissioners assess taxable property and the county sheriff or other appointee collected the money. The names of tax commissioners and other officers appointed to collect taxes are included in the records, usually in the certifications at the close of each report. And you'll see that the, the same person usually covered the, the same general area. I cannot stress this enough across the board, but really during this time period, legislation affects the tax list headers, just as legislation affects today's tax forms. You can't assume that the same header you're going to see in 1850 applies even in 1851, 1860, or any other time in between. You have to pay attention to those headers every single year. Um, tax commissioners were listing properties for state taxation, and those taxes were deposited in the state general fund. Lands reported on tax lists may be leased or may be in the patenting process. Non-residents had to pay taxes for any land they owned in Kentucky. Um, the acts of the General Assembly must be researched by legislative session. And Candy's articles break down for every single section that we're talking about here today, which laws took effect and when, and describes them in great detail. If we listed those today, that is all we would get done. Please note that county clerks record county history. The legislation process described in this article is for historical purposes. You're going to have to check revised statutes to see how current law affects taxation and business licensing. The word estate is, was very much interchangeably used with taxable property for both living and deceased taxpayers. There is a valuing under the equalizing law. Taxpayers had to report the value of other properties they owned, such as bank stocks or land in other states. Again, very detailed records and very underused. Um, I'm going to say this on every single one. You must research all pages in the tax book or you might miss something. Um, tax list records for Kentucky counties range from the year the county was created to the mid-1880s. You've got to remember, and please remind your researchers, as counties were formed in Kentucky, the, even though the land may stay the same, it could switch counties as those county formations changed a lot during the early 1800s. During the Civil War, this is only a half of a two-page sheet for the taxes that were collected during this time period. Um, again, at least the columns are typed, uh, but they could change on a regular basis. Always check the tax list. The Homestead Act um, could have played a role, may have played a role, in restoring the dream of land ownership to Kentucky soldiers or their families whose land had been sold for non-payment of taxes. Um, the Bureau of Land Management website, I highly recommend it if, if you've had researchers ever use it before. If not, I encourage you to check it out. Um, it's a great website for tracking Kentuckians who left the Commonwealth and relocated to other states, as I mentioned, for the federal, um, the public domain land, such as Missouri and Illinois. Um, you want to make sure you encourage your researchers to look at deeds that are on file with the county clerk's office or here at KDLA to determine when properties were purchased or sold. You've got to research the acts of the General Assembly for that legislation. Federal troops, you, including slavery, runaway, and education during the Civil War. This is a fact I did not know. I learn something new every day, and this one has just blown my mind. Uh, for anybody who has searched uh, compiled service records for your ancestors, or had a researcher who's, who's done research, and, and they find out that their ancestor is listed as AWOL, one of the unique facts that Candy points out, that is, if they were AWOL, between the 1st of June and the 15th of December, perhaps they went home to harvest crops or to ensure that their taxes were paid. Blew my mind. I had never heard that concept or theory before. Something very important to think about. And again, you might be able to tell that by the tax list when you see the taxes were paid for a certain time period during the Civil War here. Um, again, Records on the local county court level or the Franklin Circuit Court for cases involving sheriffs and other persons involved in tax collection can be very important. Um, area newspapers for publication of tax sales or the coverage of trials regarding county officials and revenue collection can also play a role during the Civil War time period. Any questions? I love these genealogy sessions just as much as everyone else, but they are very detailed field and boring sometimes, I think, but we have to dig into them to understand them and why they're important to help our researchers. I appreciate you all bearing with me. Okay, moving along to the post-Civil War through 1880, this original series. Thanks, Mary. I, I'm glad you all are here with me on these. Um, 
again, the, the headings are getting better. They're getting uh, better typed. Um, so this last series of records here are just as important as some of these earlies, uh, earlier records. Um, the county clerk's office isn't just limited to um, uh, land records or marriage records. Uh, don't forget your clerk's offices also have election records, minute books, business licenses, corporate articles of incorporation, in addition to the deeds, marriages, and settlement books. All of these records may help you help your researcher as they're attracting a piece of land or why they're paying taxes as well as just learning that overall picture about your ancestor. Um, the legislative acts are a true goldmine of information for researchers who are studying the history of the Commonwealth. When you're researching the acts of the General Assembly, you can find an index in the front of each volume listing the acts that are in sequential order. When the legislature um, granted tax deferments, tax collection deferments, the reports will tell you that they are missing. So that, that's good to know that, that that's something may or may not be included. Um, the tax list might indicate if an individual was totally or partially exempted from tax collection. Tax list may include more than one district in a county. The commissioners and officers appointed should be included that at the close of the report. Again, legislation affects those tax headers just as it does today. The headers in 1870 or 67 differ from 1880. All right, moving ahead. Lands reported on tax list may be leased or may be in the patenting process. Again, check all pages of that tax list report. You may find the names of taxpayers inadvertently excluded from the alphabetical listing or names and addresses of blind children under 20 years of age in the final pages of the listing of the taxpayers. The head of the household is the person responsible for reporting taxable property. Properties owned by African American taxpayers may be included in the tax assessor's listing of all taxpayers and labeled free black, or the properties may be included in a separate report. Um, African Americans or free blacks were included on tax lists prior, decades prior to the Civil War, but they were all under one report. Some counties, contingent upon the county and the year, they may have been separated from this 1866 period forward. Okay. My love my little 20 minute sessions. That is the general overview of tax lists in Kentucky. Uh, many of you probably have these records in your collections. Uh, they are also available for purchase for uh, on microfilm. If you don't have them currently in your collection, I've uploaded here uh, the download presentation pod here where you can go ahead and download a copy of this presentation. Again, a general overview. I strongly encourage you to go to KentuckyAncestors.org and check out Candy's four articles. It will break down for you every legislative change. And again, as far as migration patterns, especially before the 1850 census where only the head of household is listed on a document, these records are a gold mine. You have to search year by year. You have to search the report completely. Don't get discouraged if you don't see them for one or two years. They may have just moved. But again, don't forget about your county name changes. There, there's a lot, so much transition going on in these early years in the state. These are a gold mine. They are wonderful resources. If you have questions about these records in the future, don't hesitate to give me a call I, um, or contact Walter Bowman in our research room directly. Any of our archives research room staff would be very gracious to help you with this, as well as Candy Atkinson at the land office. She, her, the work that she has done there is a gold mine of research, and I encourage you to uh, dive into these records if you've never searched them before. So one more time, any questions on the overview of Kentucky early Kentucky tax records? All right, well, we appreciate you all joining us. Kim and I are going to hang out here for a few minutes. And uh, if not, thank you for joining us for our quick half hour session and you guys have a great rest of the day. Thanks everyone.